Okay, folks. I have just gone live here. Folks, if you could let me know that you can see my screen, it should say the simplest method to start seeds indoors. Just going to go ahead and make sure I've got this all set up and running here. All righty, let's see if we've got things here. Sounds. And make sure I've got this all set up. Okay, perfect. There we go. I can see that I'm now live there. Sorry about that. Was just getting everything squared away. I'm going to drop it into presentation mode there. Carla can see me and the screen. Yes, Ingrid can see it. Perfect. Terry can, yes, see your screen. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to go ahead and dive into a couple of housekeeping items here for us to begin diving in. Now, it looks like a lot of folks have already figured out where the uh, chat function is here. And so as we go through our session this evening, if you have any questions at any point, go ahead and ask those into the chat function because I'm gonna jump in there, answer a couple of them throughout. That's where we're gonna be doing kind of a lot of our interacting. So just to make sure that everybody knows where the chat function is and how to be utilizing it, Go ahead and let me know in there if this is your first happy hour, second, third, fourth. Let me know how many happy hours you've been on. I would absolutely love to know um, if folks have been on multiple or if this is just your first one. Let me know in the chat function there. Now, as we also begin to kind of settle in here, I really encourage everybody to grab themselves some form of a drink and a snack. Again, as you all know that have been on happy hours before, this is the happy hour shirt here. And so I don't want this feeling or looking anything like your regular Zoom meeting or work meeting, anything along those lines. So kick back, relax, get yourself a beer or a wine, a cocktail, mocktail, water, tea, anything in between. And then the last piece is to sit somewhere comfortable. So I want you to be kind of switching out of being in working mode and working brain and into just rest and relaxation. So we're going to have a heck of a lot of fun here. All right, Julia's first happy hour here. Welcome, Julia. Super great to have you. Hildy's on her fifth. Debbie, great to have you on her fourth. Sarah, fourth at least. Ingrid, I know we've sent a couple of emails back and forth. So nice to have you online here for your first one. Seen some more on their second, third, fourth. Blooming Supplies on their first. Deborah on her first as well. Amazing. So fun to have so many of you for, uh, you know, on your kind of like third or fourth happy hour and so many of you on your first as well. So for those of you that are on your first one and I haven't met before, I am Jordan from Mind and Soil, where we're looking to introduce a million individuals to mindful gardening. So maybe a little bit of a different gardening company from that perspective, because what we're really, really, really focused on is connecting people with those mental health benefits that come from gardening. So some of you that are on the happy hour here that have been gardening for multiple years, I know without a doubt that a big part of why you're so excited about these longer days that we're having, that little bit more warmth in the air and ultimately getting to spend time getting your hands dirty is because of how peaceful, how calming, how restorative gardening is and how much of a mindfulness practice it is for you. And for those of you that are on the newer side of gardening, I know that it can be pretty daunting and a little bit overwhelming. There's a lot going on, not really sure what to be doing. And so a huge part of our responsibility here at Mind and Soil is to be doing happy hours like this and lots of free education content to be helping you feel comfortable and confident in the garden so that you can more quickly be tapping into those mental health benefits. And so the one thing that I really, really encourage and recommend each of you doing at this particular moment is subscribing to our YouTube channel here because we do all of our happy hours on YouTube, but on top of that, we put out multiple videos every single week, different kind of educational pieces and entertainment pieces all to be helping you feel comfortable and confident in the garden. And on top of that, 
any question that you have over the course of the season, just leave that as a comment on a video. And I answer each and every one of those comments to start my day. So you'll probably get an answer from me within the uh, kind of first 24 hours or so. I saw Adrian's already online here. Him and I go back and forth in YouTube comments, a whole bunch there. I have a feeling he's going to have an absolutely amazing season here. And so that is the best place to get questions answered and supported over the course of the season. Now, speaking of support, speaking of education, there's something that we came here to do this evening, and that is to like kind of get ready and more, even more than that, get excited about starting seeds for the season ahead. And so folks, take a look at this little picture here. This right here, I do this every single year, is that I start a set of seeds the exact same way that I started seeds in my first year of trying to grow from seed. And so I do that kind of recreating every variable and this is what things look like. And now since then, over the course of those years, I've done a lot of experiments. I've played around with so many different variables. And so what I wanna show you now is a seed that was started on the exact same day. And this is what it looks like. That's the combination of all those different little tweaks and changes that I've made over the course of the years to be growing better and better seedlings. And so what I want to be walking through today is really everything that I've learned, all of the materials that I utilize and the exact method that I follow for starting seeds so that you don't have to start with this, but rather can kind of fast track your whole experience to something more along these lines in your first second, or maybe it's uh, you've been growing seeds for a while, still take it to that next level. So those of you that have been on happy hours before, you know what I'm about to ask here. It's how I like to kick off each and every one of these happy hours. But if you are all set for us to begin diving in, go ahead in the chat function, type in let's grow and we'll start diving into things. Now, as a couple of those roll in, I want to share this message with you that we just recently got from one of the individuals in our community. This is from Brigida, and I met Brigida right around this time last year. And what she shared, Jordan and his incredible company have developed products that my new garden and plant babies adore, the seedling mix and the worm castings. One of my best memories of 2021 was getting into gardening and incorporating Jordan's beautiful approach to health and mindfulness. So folks, when we look at this garden here, that looks like somebody that has been gardening for multiple years. But Brigitte, when I met her around this time last year, she had not gardened, she had not started seeds before. And so we took her through step by step, the method and the materials that we utilize to start seeds. And she got all these beautiful little seeds started. And then she popped those onto her boat, drove them to her cabin uh, in the boat for the summertime and had this beautiful kind of patio garden right on the deck absolutely thriving all summer long. And again, in her first year. So I am confident that if you go through the materials and the method that I'm about to share with you, you're going to have success just like this for this season. So with that being said, I can see a whole bunch of let's grows in there. Michael saying, let's grow. Jamie saying, let's grow. Yvonne saying, let's grow. And I think we should start diving in here. So we're going to break this down into two chunks. We're first going to talk about the materials that are needed to start seeds and have them growing really, really well. And then we're going to talk about the method. So beginning with the materials here, the very first of them, and there are six materials that we want to have on hand. The first one should be fairly straightforward. We need seeds. If we're going to be starting from seeds, we're going to need to have some seeds on hand here. And for myself, I've been growing with West Coast seeds for essentially the entirety of how long I've been gardening for and starting seeds from. So every picture that you see on our Instagram account, on our website, every video that you see on our YouTube account, those all come from seeds that I got from West Coast seeds. I've had tons and tons of success with them. And on top of that, they've just been such an amazing partner the last two years that I've got tons and tons of love for the folks over there at West Coast Seeds. So we need to have our seeds on hand. Let's dive into the second material. So the second material that we need to have in order to start seeds indoors is something to put the seeds into. We need some form of a seedling mix. And so this is an area where I am without a doubt, everybody knows this, extremely biased to our worm casting seedling mix. This is uh, the, the product that tons and tons of us utilize. 
And the reason why I kind of love it so much, I've been working so hard on it the last three years is because it has fresh, finely sifted compost in there and all the worm castings so that as we germinate those seeds and they begin to grow, they're not in a sterile environment, but rather they are completely uh, kind of blanketed and covered in little enzymes, bacteria, microorganisms, and nutrients for them to really be thriving from day one. And so the head horticulturalist over at West Coast Seeds, she did a trial of it side by side with another one. And look at these charred seeds where it was grown in our seedling mix here. You can just see how much bigger they are, but on top of that is how much more lush and full of life they are. That is because of that non-sterile environment, the worm castings and the compost in there. So we're gonna talk a little bit more towards the end about how you can get your hands on some of that seedling mix. So if we have seeds, and we have seedling mix, well, we need something to put those into. And so the third material is our seed cells and tray. And so on this front, you know, this is where I probably do things a little bit different to some folks in that I start all of my seeds in a three inch seed cell. What's fairly common is for folks to start things in kind of like a one inch seed cell, and then about three weeks in, to kind of pot them up or transfer them into something this size. For me, I just think, hey, I don't know if I necessarily need to be doing that. I'd rather just kind of eliminate one step, make it a little bit more simple and start them in a slightly larger environment. But what I've noticed on top of that is that by having a larger area, there's less uh, air interacting with it. So it holds on to moisture for a longer period of time. And for our seeds to germinate, they need two really important variables. They need warmth and they need moisture. So by starting in a three inch seed cell, there's more moisture in and around them that gives them a higher likelihood of germinating. Alrighty, so excuse me here. That is our third material. Now, the fourth material is without a doubt the most important one. And so I wish that I could say that, you know, number two, the seedling mix, if you've got that, then you are off to the races. There's no stopping you, but there's actually something that is even more important. And so the fourth material that we want to have on hand that I really, really encourage everybody to look into is a grow light. Now, the grow light is ultimately what we need for the plant to be growing big and strong. And so the kind of analogy that I suppose I like to utilize is that if we were to think about our little seed as the car or the vehicle and the seedling mix is its fuel source that it's grabbing its nutrients from ultimately to be putting on growth. But if it doesn't have an engine or it's got a really poor engine, well, then it can only go so fast. It can only grow so big. And so take a look at this because I've been doing this experiment um, to kind of show how big of a difference lighting has on a plant's growth. And so take a look at this first picture here. This is in my windowsill. And I've got this app on my phone called Light Meter. And as we can see, there are 4,041 lumens coming through that window for the plant to be absorbing. But look at our plants right here they are all what is called leggy. So when we see plants going really, really tall and long and bending over towards the light source, in this instance, the window, that is a classic indicator or sign that they are saying, I'm not getting enough light and therefore I'm going to grow towards the light source to try and get more of it. So if that is the case, if you're seeing that, we need to be getting more light to those plant babies. And so the reason why a window is a bit of a challenge is because, you know, 4,000 lumens, that's not bad, but that is like in the middle of the day, the sun was out and there's snow on the ground that's kind of like diffusing it or bringing more light into that area. And so what happens on an overcast day? What happens on a rainy day? That number ends up being significantly lower. They're not nearly getting enough light on those days. And then what happens when the sun sets at 4.30 p.m. and it only comes up at seven or eight in the morning, they're only getting eight or nine hours of light. And that might not even be direct light over the course of that day. So that's where I started to get really curious about grow lights. And in that first year, remember that seedling that I showed you at the very beginning? I utilized a grow light for that but I had no idea what I was doing. I bought a grow light and take a look at this. So the same application, but now that's not a, a, a one there. That is only 555 lumens. 
So now we're like even lower in terms of how much light the plants are getting. And ultimately they're then growing so much slower. That's why that first picture that you saw from me, the one seedling that I grew in my first year, way, way, way behind the seedling um, that I'm growing now because it's not getting enough light. So let's now look at the grow light that I now utilize that is available on our website. And I arrived at utilizing this grow light because last year, I tested out about six different grow lights side by side in my seed starting station, put up little barriers and blockers so I could see exactly how each light was performing and take a look at this. So now we're up to 36,920 lumens directly on top and above of the plants. And you can just see the foliage down there, how big and lush all of it is. You know, those plants, they've got their engine now and they've got their fuel source. So they are wanting to go off to the races and just grow, grow and grow. So a grow light, if there's one piece that you take from the materials, the grow light is going to be the biggest thing that has an impact on you taking your seed starting to the next level. And I can see a question that came through there. Does the bracket come with the grow light in the kit? Yes, this is one of the reasons why I absolutely loved this grow light is that when you get it out of your box from us, all that you're going to need to do is put it onto a stand. And we have a video on our YouTube account of what types of like four different um, stands that you can go with, but it's got these height adjusting kind of like cords that you'd be able to utilize to move it up and down and hang it to any structure that you need. So really, really easy to put together and be utilizing. Amazing question there from, I can see it's Baron Selena, something along those lines. Amazing question. Speaking of questions, we've got two more supplies to go through and I'm gonna pause after we go through our supplies or materials to answer a couple of questions. So if you have any questions on the materials that we've discussed so far or that we haven't discussed so far, go ahead and start typing those into the chat function while I wrap up on our last two materials. So our fifth material that we want to be utilizing is a thermometer. And the reason why we wanna have a thermometer on hand is because again, remember for a seed to germinate and to begin to grow, it needs to be in a warm and moist environment. And so we wanna have that thermometer hand to ensure that it is at least 70 Fahrenheit. And so I wanna show you another picture of another experiment that I've just wrapped up running here. And so what I did was I started the same seeds in the same seed cells in the same seedling mix underneath the same light, everything the exact same, except for the temperature of the room that they were in. Take a look at this. So when it was 50 Fahrenheit, we've got nothing that is germinating except for a tough couple of really, really hardy and resilient kale seeds here. They're somehow able to fight through, but they're kind of hanging on for dear life there. Now, when we move up to 60 Fahrenheit, we can see that we've got some kale that has germinated and it started to put on a couple of leaves, so it's doing okay. And then our basil, you know, a few of them have germinated, but they're kind of looking like how the kale looks at 50 Fahrenheit where they're just trying to survive. And you'll see in a video that we launch on Sunday where I go through this whole experiment that we have some tomatoes that also germinated. But once we get into the 70 Fahrenheit range, that is where things really, really begin to take off. And it's at that temperature that our plants truly begin to thrive. And this is why I'm such a big fan of starting things indoors is because for us to get towards that 70 Fahrenheit, 20, 21 Celsius, you know, it's gonna be a couple of months still until those are the temperatures outside. So we can kind of fast track our season by starting things in a warmer environment right now. And the best part about it is that if some seeds didn't germinate or something went wrong, anything along those lines, we just buy a couple of replacement seedlings as we roll into the season and you've still got your full family of little plant babies making their way into the garden. So there's really zero risk to starting seeds. It's just the best. All right, and so our sixth and final uh, uh, material that we're gonna be going through here is my favorite watering supply. And that is a turkey baster. So this is not, you know, your fancy, beautiful, wonderful, watering spouted can finger my bob. This is just your old fashioned turkey baster. The reason why I love the turkey baster so much is that it limits the amount of water that you can get out at once. And so that means we have to be putting the water in a little bit more slowly, which allows it to really evenly work its way into the seedling mix. 
And then the second piece is that as those plant babies grow, as this one is here, the kind of long spout of the turkey baster, that allows for you to get in and around, kind of dipping and dodging all throughout the stems to get the water right down to where the root zone is. So turkey baster, I absolutely love to always have on hand. So I'm going to dive into a couple of questions, but just before I do that, the materials that we've walked through so far, all six of those, that is what our seed starting kit consists of. So we put in there everything that I utilize to start my seeds. So if you don't want to have to run around to try and find seed cells and trays and seeds, and then probably have to custom mix up your own seedling mix to get something similar, we will ship each and every one of those pieces in one box right to your door. You'd have it in time for March so that you can get everything started. Um, so that seed starting kit has everything that we've covered off on so far here. So before we dive into the method, I'm going to dive over here into the comments to see a couple of the questions that have come through here. Okay. I'm also concerned about temperature. So I've got a couple of questions coming through for temperature. Yvonne, you are the absolute best for translating all the Fahrenheit Celsius pieces. In some of our YouTube videos, we mentioned them uh, in both there. The key temperature that you want to be getting to is 70 Fahrenheit, 20, 21 Celsius. Now, that question that came through in terms of I'm concerned about temperature and getting things up to that temperature, there are really kind of two, I'd say three ways that you can go about ensuring that that temperature is at least 70 Fahrenheit. First one is obviously just your house thermostat. Turn that up to 70 put your thermometer into the area where you're planning to start your seeds and make sure that it is at least 70. If it's not, keep on turning up the house temperature for that seed starting period. Um, and then you can turn it down a little bit later on. But that is of course, meaning that you're heating your whole house. So the second option is to build out a seed starting station and put something like a sheet over top of it. So that area is enclosed with a little space heater in the bottom. So in my seed starting station, I've got a little space heater in there. It turns it up to 20, 21 Celsius. And then as soon as it goes above that, it turns it off. And then once it dips below, it turns it back on. And then the third option would be to go with a heating mat. And so this, you just plug into the wall and then you put that underneath the seedling mix and the, the seed trays where the cells are sitting. And that's going to heat up the seedling mix. It's going to heat up that really small area and make it a little bit warmer. If you do utilize a uh, heating mat, just keep a really close eye on the seedling mix and make sure that it stays nice and moist. All right. I think that answers a couple of questions there on the heating mat. Perfect. Let's see here. Uh, question from Antoinette, uh, do the grow lights offer the warmth the heat seedlings require? Um, and so these, uh, the, the grow lights that I utilize, they don't really give off any heat whatsoever because they are LEDs. Uh, and so it's more the ambient temperature in there that I like to have at at least 70 Fahrenheit. And I need to get that up to that temperature by utilizing a small little space heater. Perfect. I can see a question from uh, Dave here. What number grow light bulbs? Um, Dave, all the information for the grow lights that we have in terms of like those technical specific numbers are on our website. If you're doing some form of a comparison from one to the next, um, from that perspective, I find that information like really overwhelming, which for me is why I just bought six different grow lights. And I was like, I'm just gonna do them side by side, see which ones grow best and kind of have a bit of an understanding and a feel for those pieces. Um, and so ultimately, rather than just going off of like numbers, data, uh, and the figures behind it, like the specs on it, um, I went primarily off of what's performing best for the plants, which what I found was that it wasn't necessarily the most powerful one. All right. See if we can get one or two more questions here. Where do I get the heating mats? You'll find those at any nurseries. You'll also find those at hydroponic stores. Um, so you could look for hydroponic stores even before nurseries and they'd definitely be carrying them as well. Great question from Renee here. Would you recommend a water meter for the soil? Great, great, great question there, Renee. And so as we walk through the method, I'm going to explain to you how I go about uh, watering and on what frequency. Um, I haven't utilized a water meter at all in the past. 
Um, it's something that I, I can definitely see the value of it. But I think for myself, I've wanted to pay more attention to what signs and signals I'm able to derive from the plant, the leaves, and the soil, um, and then kind of make my inferences off of that. So it's more than anything, just something that I haven't played around with, but I absolutely could see the value in it. All right, let's answer one more here. So this is really cool. Yeah, from, from Val, I will be starting my seeds in a utility room. The freezer puts off significant heat, so I won't have to turn up the house heat. This is a really, really great strategy. So find some of those utilities in your house that give off a lot of heat and build out a little seed starting station in and around there. Christy in our community, she did that right beside her furnace last year and had tons and tons of plant babies. There was an individual who bought our seed starting kit. And this is what's so cool about the grow light that we have, right? Is that it comes with these little height adjustment cords. And so she shared that last year, she started her seeds on top of her fridge. And it just happened that like there's a little bit of warmth that comes off of the top of it, really, really great. But there obviously isn't too much light up there. And so what she's gonna be able to do is put a couple of hooks, just two small hooks that cost like $5.60 into the roof and then hang the grow light down from that. So she's increasing her footprint 0%. And now the plant babies are gonna be getting all the warmth that they need, but also all of the light. When we had our uh, consult and we're chatting about it, I was just over the moon about um, you know hearing how she's gonna be able to utilize the same space and just drop something down from the ceiling. So really, really cool way to be utilizing one of the utilities in her house for that. Okay, so what I want to dive into next is the method for kind of utilizing these materials. And after that, we'll answer a couple more questions. And again, if at any point I don't get to a question that you have, just drop that as a comment on any of the videos that we have launched. And I will get an answer to you again, probably within 24 hours. And if uh, seed starting is something that like you're very interested in wanting to learn more about, over the course of the coming weeks, we've got a whole bunch of videos that are coming out on the different experiments that I've been running. So once again, would really encourage you to subscribe to the channel here because all those videos are launching over the coming weeks weeks. So the method for starting our seeds, it's really, really simple. And I start all of my seeds the exact same way. So the very first step, and there's only five steps that we have to be going through, is that we want to fill those seed cells up to about one centimeter from the top. So I line them up, and then I'm just dumping or taking handfuls and putting that into the seed cells. And the last thing that I like to do is just give it a little bit of a shake there so that it's evenly sitting across the seed cell. And so at the end of that, it should be looking something like this, kind of along those lines right there. So step one, already done and dusted. Step two, what we're going to be doing is again, what is the environment that our seeds need to germinate? They need to be in a warm environment and they need to be in a moist environment. So I am going to add my first round of water here. So I'm going to take my turkey baster, fill it up, head over to my seed cell and put that full turkey base of water into the seed cell there. And that's ensuring that all that seedling mix is starting to get nice and moist before we even get our seeds in there. All right, so once we've done that, it's looking like this. We can see that the color of the mix, it's gone from being kind of like a milk chocolate to something more like a dark chocolate at this point. And two of our five steps are already done and dusted. So I really hope that this is kind of feeling like, oh, this isn't so hard. This is fairly easy. There's not too much going on here. Let's dive into our third step. So our third step for starting our seeds is that we need to place our seeds into this seed cell here. I'm gonna show you a video in just a second, but for those of you that were not on our garden planning happy hour a couple of weeks ago, I kind of my rule of thumb and my personal philosophy on it is that I like to put five seeds into each one of these seed cells. And for smaller seeds like basil, you could even do more, something like 10 along those lines. The reason why we put multiple seeds in there is because sometimes one of them just won't germinate. And so if we only had one seed in there, well, then we've kind of put all of our eggs into the basket of that one seed. But if we have five seeds in there, then it essentially ensures that we're going to get seeds germinating. And the way that I go about it is that each seed cell represents one plant for me. So if I wanted, let's say, three tomato plants, I would set three seed cells aside for tomatoes. 
I would put five seeds into each of them, 15 tomato seeds in total, and go about starting them that way. So all I need to do is place those five seeds into the seed cell, dump some out into my hand, and then I just evenly space them out. You can see the first one on the top left, then top right, right down the middle, and then two on the bottom. Dramatic zoom in as I grab a little sip of water there. All righty, so we got our seed cells in there. And then I'm just going to go about and do kind of the, the rest of them going one to the next. So, you know, if I started with my cucumbers there, then basil, and then kale, tomatoes, zucchinis. And this is one thing that, you know, kind of step out of being in seed starting, go, go, go mindset for a moment. I really, really encourage you to like set an afternoon or an evening aside for your seed starting. Allow yourself all the time that you need to just kind of pitter patter your way through it and really enjoy the beginning of the gardening season. You know, starting seeds, it really like for me, it marks the beginning of the season. I get so excited about it um, and just kind of thinking and dreaming about the season ahead. And so I really encourage you to enjoy that moment and to take your time with it. Again, have something to drink, get your favorite snack, maybe a little bit of charcuterie and just enjoy the overall session of starting your seeds. And my hope is that it's starting to feel really, really straightforward and easy there. So now that we've got our seeds in there, we wanna get those nice and moist as well. So we grab our turkey baster and we do our second full turkey baste of water. So to each one of them, I'm just going around and evenly distributing a full turkey baste of water. And this is ensuring that those seeds that we just placed in there, like we are putting water right on top of them at this point. So when we take a look at it, we can now see our seeds are in there and the seedling mix is really nice and dark, super, super moist at this point. Those seeds are getting into a really good position to germinate and grow. All righty, on to our fourth step here. And so now that we've got the seeds in there, the last thing that we need to be doing in terms of preparing them is that we need to cover them with just a little bit more seedling mix. And for myself, I do about a half handful. And this is something that like, it is not an exact science by any stretch. If you did a little bit more, that's okay. If you did a little bit less, you're gonna be okay as well. So I'm going with about a half handful of seedling mix for each of them, just dumping that on top. And then I'll go back through and I'll give them kind of again, like a little bit of a shake just to evenly mix that seedling uh, mix across the top there. And so once I put that little bit of coverage over top, and I like to keep that probably like to a centimeter or less, the last thing that I'm doing there is just adding the third and final turkey base of water. So now by adding this last one in, we've got the seedling mix above moist, we've got the seeds themselves moist, and then all of that has been trickling into the bed of seedling mix down below where they were. So now it is in that really, really great kind of moist environment for it to begin germinating. And so what that means is that we are on to our fifth and final step here, and that is finding that space for them that is going to be sufficiently warm. So what we want to do is that we want to basically pick up our seeds and take them to somewhere in our house where it is again going to be at least 20, 21 Celsius or 70 Fahrenheit. That's what we're looking for in terms of temperature here. And I know that there were a couple of questions that came through in terms of like how to go about heating an area up. I want you to play this video one more time here so that you can see that little space heater and you can see right here behind me that is in there enclosed by the sheets and it's going to be keeping it nice and warm in that space. And you can see on the thermometer there, it's sitting right at 70 Fahrenheit, 21 Celsius. So in a super, super good kind of environment for it to begin growing and taking off and germinating. And so what do I do from here, right? Like, all right, that's like, in some ways, that's all I have to do in order to get my seeds germinating. So what we do from here is that we leave our plant babies underneath those grow lights with the grow light on for 12 to 13 hours per day. And that's all that we wanna be doing. We've given them everything that they need to germinate. So we just wanna have them hanging out underneath that grow light for 12 to 13 hours per day. But coming back to one of those previous questions, what do you do about watering? How often do you go about watering? And so 
what I have done and put together for each and every one of you. And it is going to be emailed into your inbox tomorrow morning is a little seed starting tracker where it's got all the materials that you're going to need for starting your seeds. And then a little kind of method checklist down below so you can keep track of when you are watering. And my recommendation for you is to be watering kind of every two to three days if you're following this method that we have gone through. So if it's right kind of in and around 70 Fahrenheit, um, 20, 21 Celsius, then you want to be watering every two to three days. And I specifically say every two to three days because if you're utilizing a fan, it's gonna dry up a little bit faster. If it's 24, 25 Celsius, it's going to dry up a little bit faster. So it's not going to be an exact science for each and every one of us, but rather it's going to vary for each of us a little bit there. One really great way to kind of keep an eye on this is that if you look at the seedling mix and if it starts to look more like milk chocolate, kind of a lighter brown color than dark chocolate, that is a sign that it has dried up and it is ready for its next watering. And as you get further into the process, that's going to get faster and faster and you're going to need to give it a little bit more water. But if it's in that kind of like dark chocolate place, it's looking nice and moist, then you're in a good position. So what I want to do here to begin kind of wrapping it up is that I want to actually show you what happens next, right? So I literally started those seeds that I just walked you through step by step. And I you know, jotted that then down into the uh, seed starting tracker here. So you can see that I've got my tomato babies, my kale babies, basil, cukes, and zooks. And we are on day zero. So what I want to do next is I now want to fast forward to day three. So let's take a look here, folks, and let's see what's happening on day three. So as we dive in, we can see nothing yet has germinated except for a couple of little kale babies. And so on day three, I'm doing my first watering here. I just go with one turkey base of water through each of the seed cells there. That's all that you would need to be doing. I would fill that back up and I would move on to the next seed cell right here and evenly distribute it all across and then on to the next one as well. And then on my seed starting tracker, I would check off. Yep, I watered everything for day three with the one turkey base and we are all good to go on that front. So let's now fast forward to day six. And this is like, this is where it gets like so cool and so wild because literally by just following the method, following the steps and doing that watering, take a look. We have plant babies coming through. So basil, the zucchini, all five of the tomatoes there, three cucumbers already up and a couple of the kale babies as well, all successfully germinated within six days. We are only on day six here. And so as you can see, I'm doing my next round of watering. So that water is going in, one turkey base of water for each one of those seed cells. All right, so the last thing that I want to show this evening here before we dive into a little bit of Q&A is that I want to show you what this looks like by continuing to follow this process, but a couple of weeks into the future. So let's now go to day 25 and let's look at these plant babies. Check this out. Here we go. We can see all of them absolutely thriving at this point. The basil, the tomatoes are absolutely huge there. The cukes, they're looking super, super happy and healthy. And then the kale at the end there as well. Really, really nice. And as we can see with that seedling mix there, it's ready for its next watering as well, which is what I would have done right after this video here. So folks, if you follow the materials that I kind of went through at the beginning there and the method that I walked us through and just kind of step by step there, I guarantee, guarantee, guarantee that you're going to end up with results like this. And so that's everything that I wanted to cover off on. And so for any of you that are interested or intrigued to utilize some of our products, we got a couple of really, really exciting things for you. So on that front, our seed starting kit, which has literally everything that we went through today, as well as all the videos for how to go about starting your seeds, we are offering that with free shipping all across Canada. So we are going to ship that right to your door. You'll have everything that you need by the time that we get to March so that you can be starting your seeds. 
And this is the thing is that I'm so confident with um, what we've put together in the years of work of kind of figuring out the different materials and the method that we offer a 100% money back guarantee on that, that you are going to start seeds successfully. And then for those of you that already have, say, a grow light or your seed cells and you just need the seedling mix, we are offering free delivery on that across Canada on all three bag orders through the end of the weekend. So if you want to purchase either one of those, there is literally a link in the description of this video that will take you to both of those product pages. And on top of that, anybody that's kind of placing their order this evening, we're shipping those out tomorrow morning. So like 9 a.m. tomorrow, those are getting packaged up out the door. They are going to be to your house before we even get into um, March when a lot of the seeds are ultimately going to be getting started there. So those are the two pieces on that front in terms of um, ways that we want to be able to get the products to you. And so the last piece on that front is that, you know, like every, every dollar that we earn through those sales, it goes just back into fueling video content like that. So it pays for all the course or like the, the, the videos that we put together on YouTube. And then, you know, ultimately us being able to put on happy hours like that as well. So um, we're still even before break even um, in terms of the business and every dollar is just getting pumped back into creating as much educational content as we can to be helping as many people as possible feel those gardening, uh, those mental health benefits that come from gardening. So folks, that is everything that I want to cover off on this evening. I've seen a whole bunch of questions whizzing through in there. And so what I want to do next is kind of jump into some of those questions and start answering some of those. And I'm going to flip to the next screen here because I'd also love to know if anybody is going to be at the BC Home and Garden Show in just a few weeks here. But I'm going to start diving into some questions here. All righty. I can see a couple questions in terms of uh, like a fan as well as a humidity dome. So these are absolutely, um, you know, items that, that are useful. And I put them into kind of like the like nice to have category where do you 100% need them to be starting seeds? No, but do they add some value and are beneficial? Yeah, definitely. So you would utilize a fan to simulate wind blowing through there. And that's going to just kind of like gently blow the seedlings over a little bit. And that's going to make them a little bit stronger and a little bit larger. Now, as you saw for myself, I have my little kind of like space heater in there and it does double as a fan. But what I do is when they're germinating in that first kind of seven day period, I don't put that fan on them. I put it like directly into the sheet so that no air is going directly towards them. The reason why is because if I did that, it would dry up the seedling mix more quickly. And I want it to be really nice and just kind of moist in that first period for them to germinate. And then once we get to around kind of day 14 and everything's germinated, that's when I would turn the fan and ultimately have it blowing towards them um, and just kind of hardening them up and um, getting them a little bit larger, a little bit more sturdy early on in their life. And then a humidity dome, that is once again, just kind of like an item that you would be utilizing to keep it nice and moist in there. If you do go with a humidity dome, my recommendation is to get one that is at least kind of like six inches in height. Because what's going to happen is that some of your plants are going to germinate super, super quickly, and they're going to start growing quite tall, very, very fast, like a cucumber, a zucchini, et cetera. And they might actually end up blocking um, or like, like running into the top of those really short humidity domes. So go with one that has a little bit more clearance on it so you can leave it over top of it for the entirety of the germination process. Again, it's not something that I personally utilize, um, but it's definitely like there definitely is merit and value to it. All right. Question from Carla here. I've had um, soil grow mold on it. How do I prevent that? So on that front, you know, you do want it to dry out. So allow it to go to the point of drying out um, and then put that next round of water in there. Another option is that you could do a little bit more kind of like bottom watering. So from the bottom, and that's going to leave the top of it nice and dry. Um, and the third piece is that like, it, it's not a major worry or concern by any stretch. Um, there's always like a little bit of like growth here and there in a non-sterile environment. And so I don't get too concerned when I see anything like that um, on my end over here. All right. Lisa has all of her plant babies hanging out in her office. She's got a great seed starting setup there. And 
I'm going to be doing a video a little bit later on going over to Lisa's place because she has the best technique for um, trellising and holding up her raspberry canes. And so I'm actually going to be stealing that idea from her, doing a whole video on it and building that out at my house here. All right, let's see some more questions. Gail, love to hear that you are finding the tracker helpful there. And folks, I would love to hear um, you know, what has been kind of most valuable, useful in here as well. I'd love a little bit of feedback on um, what has resonated here. All right, I'm gonna scroll down a little ways here. All right, there's a question there. Will you offer free shipping on the grow lights? So there will be free shipping on the grow lights when it comes with the seedling mix. So if you were to purchase your three bags of seedling mix, we can pop a grow light into that um, same box and we'll ship all that off to you together. Amazing. Jason, Colleen, thanks so much for the words there. Great question. Okay, amazing question here from Ashley. Ashley asked, do you ever pre-soak certain seeds? So this is a really, really great question. And for myself, this is the way that I have gone about starting all of my seeds. But last year, as an example, I tried to start my butternut squash seed that way and none of them germinated. And so that's where I would get a little bit curious what's going on here. And Lisa, when she was actually picking up her soil the other day, she mentions that she pre-soaks her butternut squash seeds. And so that's something that I will be trying with those ones this year. So the key takeaway from that, Ashley, is don't focus on trying to get it all perfect or right the first try, the first year, anything along those lines, but rather start with something, see what works. And then the things that don't work, start playing around with, okay, how do I fix this? How do I do that a little bit better? And so I think what I've found with this method is that like it works for 80 to 90% of the seeds. And there probably are some little like nuanced ones out there that I should be doing a little bit differently in order to have them germinate, have a higher uh, number of them germinating. Um, but I use this as my starting point because if I can be doing everything the exact same, that's a heck of a lot easier than having a whole bunch of different ways for starting seeds. Um, so that would be my advice on that front. And that's kind of like, I would say just like an overall etho that I have when it comes to gardening. And so I would not actually classify myself as a gardening expert, um, but rather in pursuit of expert. And so it's the first five letters of that word that are so key, E-X-P-E-R. And so to become an expert at something requires experience, right? We don't just immediately kind of wake up and we are an expert gardener. We have years and years of experience that we gain in order to become an expert. But over those years, we could be doing things the exact same and not actually playing around. And so what I put in the middle there is experiments. So experience, experiments, those ultimately drive towards expertise. And so kind of like my, I guess, yeah, like big philosophy or approach with gardening is I like to always be experimenting, playing around, understanding what's working, what's not working. And that's how each and every year, my yield, my bounty, my harvest has increased. I never really focus on that, but rather it comes as a byproduct of having that experience and experimenting mindset. So a little bit of a rambling answer for you there, Ashley. <laughs> Great question from Alexis. How close are your grow lights to the emerging seeds and the seedlings to prevent leggy plants? So with the grow lights that I utilize, I keep them about six inches off of the top of the seeds. So at the very beginning, they're pretty low down. As the seeds grow, with those little height adjustment cords that I have, I just move them up. And this is a big part of why I actually love two foot grow lights is because if we just had a four foot grow light, you know, that's gonna cover all the way one side to the next and it's gonna stay at the same height, say like this pen here. But if we had two two foot grow lights, then all of a sudden they're right beside each other. We can drop one down and leave the other one higher up. And that just makes it a little bit easier for ensuring that each of our plants are in the right area, the right zone to be getting the requisite amount of light. Amazing question there, Alexis. Ava, she's got her worm castings. Love it. Adrian's thinking of going to the home and garden show. Amazing. So yeah, I will be on stage three times at the BC home and garden show. Um, two of those are on Saturday. So if you're planning to make it, um, I will be there on Saturday. I'm doing a talk with West Coast Seeds around lunchtime and then doing a talk on mindful gardening um, towards the end of the day there. And I would absolutely love to meet so many of you in person. So if any of you are in the lower mainland, you're thinking of heading to the BC home and garden show, um, 
Um, would absolutely love to see you at the events and please do come and say hi afterwards. I love doing events like this, but it's also so nice to put names and faces together in person. Okay, another question here from Michael Noon. Amazing question. Do you cut back the seedlings to get just one good plant? So remember, um, as I was walking you through on kind of day six there, and we saw that there were, let's say, three of those cucumber plants that had germinated and four of those tomato plants that had germinated. Let's use the tomatoes as the example here. And let's say that I only needed two tomato plants and I've already got four in there. Um, so I could split that in half. Um, and well, I, sorry, let me go back a little bit further here. Let's say that I, I've got my two seed cells and four germinated in each of them. So I've got eight little baby tomato plants growing and I only need two in my garden. So I'm not going to do anything to those until I move them into the garden. Um, if it gets really, really chaotic in my seed starting area, I'll thin out a few of the smallest ones, but I try to save all that for after I've moved them into the garden beds. The reason why is because I wanna make sure that they all transplant successfully. And then once they have transplanted and have been in the garden beds for you know kind of three, four, five days, I'll pick the one that looks like it's growing the best and remove the other ones. The other piece to that is that you know there's a high likelihood, let's use that same example, right? Of I want two tomato plants and I've got two seed cells and there's four plants growing in each of them. Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep my one seed cell. I'm just gonna rip that into two and plant those two um, leaves. Now I still have a full seed cell of four tomato babies in there. My big encouragement to you is that if you've got extra seedlings, give those away, give the gift of gardening to somebody else in your life. So when I have all these extra seedlings after I've done my transplanting and I know that kind of I've got enough in my garden, I just post on our little kind of neighborhood Facebook group, anybody want free seedlings, I've got a whole bunch of extra ones, swing by the house and it makes so many people so happy and it introduces even more individuals to gardening. So that would be kind of the second piece to that point there um, on that question there, Michael. All right, Lisa, I think I answered your question on the humidity domes there. Um, question for Brielle, is the seedling mix different from the worm castings? Yes, Brielle, there's a number of other elements in the seedling mix so that you don't have to be going and buying a whole bunch of different things and mixing together your own custom seed starting bl uh, blend or seed starting mix. All right. Great question from Kathy here. Not sure if I missed it. How long are we looking after starting the seedlings to transplanting? So it's actually more working backwards. And the question is, when can we transplant? And from there, when should I be starting the seeds? And that's where you want to utilize one of the planting charts, such as the ones from West Coast Seeds, to determine um, when you would be going about starting those seeds. And so uh, in that you know, particular instance, um, let's take you know, where, where I live, a lot of the things can be transplanted in and around mid-May. So peppers, they can go in, zucchinis, cucumbers, tomatoes, they can all go in and around then. And so I'm working back from that to start them. Zucchinis and cucumbers, those grow really, really fast. I wouldn't be starting those until about a month beforehand. My peppers, on the other hand, I've already started those seeds and they're already starting to grow um, because they, you know, they're, they, they're not going to complain with having a couple extra months in their lives there. So rather than um, starting all your seeds at one point and then determining when to transplant, determine when it is first warm enough to transplant and then work back from there. And we're going to have a whole session on kind of how to go about transplanting, but also how to deal with kind of like extreme weather in that early stretch. So if a heat dome rolls through, what to do, or if we have like a January where it's really, really cold and rainy, what to be doing to kind of allow your plants to thrive in the early parts of the season there. Alrighty, I think that we will do one more question here. Let's see if I can find one. Great question from, from Leah. Can I put too much worm castings on my seeding soil? Um, no, you could start seeds in 100% worm castings. However, I've done this. They're not going to grow as well in that. They need um, a little bit just more structure in there, right? Worm castings, that's 100% organic matter. Um, and so what you would wanna be doing is mixing that into some form of a potting mix or a seed starting mix with some fresh sifted compost. And then um, you, know, you probably do like anywhere from 10 to 30% worm castings. Um, and that would be sufficient for the plants. All righty. 
Let's answer one more here. Yeah, question uh, from Jason and Colleen. George, will you be doing a video on potting up? And so, yeah, and this is a great question to kind of wrap up on um, is that again, you know, we've answered a bunch of questions this evening, but there's only so much that we'd be able to get to in an hour here. And I want to be supporting you all through the season. So videos on how to be going about starting seeds. We are launching tons of those over the course of the coming weeks. What's the impact that temperature has on starting seeds? What's the impact that lighting has on starting seeds? This whole video that we just went through on how to go about starting seeds, when to be potting up your seeds. So to answer that question, yes and a whole bunch more. And that's going to roll into more video, more content, all leading into the season, transplanting things. Um, and then uh, ultimately again, that, that weather piece. And then I'm gonna do a lot of stuff on succession planting as well. So we can get kind of a full second crop in and that's going to lead all the way through the summer there as well. So if you've enjoyed what we've covered off on this evening, biggest recommendation that I could make there is once again, just kind of subscribe to the channel here and you'll get notified when we launch each and every one of those videos. But folks, that is everything that I wanted to answer. If you've got any questions on the product side or placing your order, I'm gonna be available on our website chat function for the rest of the evening. So you can find me over there. Other than that, I'm so excited for all of you to have kind of now the information, the knowledge to be starting those seeds. And please keep me posted on how it goes over the course of the season here. And then other than that, I'll definitely catch all of you on our next happy hour, which will be in about a month from now. You'll get the email notifications for it um, when you subscribe to our newsletter there. So I'll catch you all at that point. Thank you all so much for the amazing, amazing questions and comments today. Um, it's incredible how many of them are coming through there and any other ones, just leave it as a comment on a video and I'll get to it. So folks, thank you all so much. Have a great evening and I'll catch you on the next one.